He has been and is a leader of some of the most well-known technology companies on the planet. He also leads a venture capital firm that helps grow technology startups. Ray Lane, a managing partner at Kleiner Perkins, Caulfield & Byers, and also the non-executive chairman of Hewlett Packard, is this week's leader on leadership. Knowing when to ask for help is critical when you're in a leadership position. It's getting the best out of people. That's the essence of leadership. Major funding for Leaders on Leadership is provided by Greenleaf Trust. Helping people manage their wealth, accumulate assets, and preserve those assets for generational continuity implies trust. We are sitting down on the same side of the desk as you are. We're planning for your financial needs Additional funding provided by the Wayne State University School of Business Administration. Welcome to Leaders on Leadership, here with a student audience on campus at the Wayne State University and Detroit Public Television Midtown Detroit studio. I'm Larry Phobes. Ray Lane is a very successful high-tech entrepreneurial leader who began by studying mathematics, not business. Thanks for being here, Ray. Thank you, Larry. Your, your first career step was 10 years at IBM and with a whole range of careers across the time. Now, I understand you working as a product manager. How does a math major get into sales and marketing at a computer company? Great question. So uh, most math majors, when they finish their bachelor's degree, really don't know what they're going to do. So the ones that do know what they're going to do really are going to go on to graduate school and then get their doctorate and teach. But no one asks the question, what do you do with a math degree if you're going to leave and go out into business? And of course, that was, it was in 1968, right at the height of Vietnam. And so we had to go serve the country, and we did. And so I, I went for two years and, and served in the U.S. Army. When I came back, uh, I asked this question you just asked me, and I interviewed with the CIA, and just a random interview, and, the, and this person at the CIA gave me great advice. He said, you have a blend of technical and math skills that I like a lot, problem-solving skills, but I also like the fact that you're very interpersonal that you've got some leadership skills. And I, in fact, had been a senior class president, had been president of my fraternity, had done a number of things that were leadership oriented. And he said, I think the place you would enjoy most would be IBM. So I joined IBM and they put me into a sales training position. Then the next career stop was at EDS. Right. A complete, it's still information technology, but it's a bit of a shift because now you're working at a company where computers are tools to serve the client, not the end product. How's the viewpoint well, like, change? Like most people in the day, in the 1960s, when you went to work for a company, you probably thought you'd retire at that company. Oh. So I went to IBM to be CEO. 300,000 other people were there to be CEO as well. Uh, so I never thought about leaving IBM. The person that hired me at IBM left after 24 years with with IBM and went to EDS. And he called me and he said, uh, you're the second smartest person I've ever hired. Of course, I asked, well, what happened to the first smartest person? He said, he turned me down. But I'd like to offer you a vice president position. You would certainly skip, skip a number of years in your career, but come and run a division. I was 30 years old. And I thought, wow, I get a chance to run a division, be a vice president, work for Ross Perot, uh, in the early days, which was a lot of fun, and, uh, and so I took the chance. And, uh, but I don't think I would have done it had I not known the person that was hiring me from IBM. I trusted him, and we went and we had a lot of fun in the early days, long before GM bought EDS. Now, ironically, Hewlett Packard owns oh, EDS. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, interesting. So then the next step was off to Booz Allen Hamilton to do consulting. As you said, it was the early days of the computer information technology system. Did anybody know how to use computers to help their business in those days, or was it? Not a... really. It, it, so the, the computer business was really all about uh, work productivity. 
So uh, there was no, of course, uh, personal computer business. There was no smartphone business. It was all about big mainframes and many computers from HP and digital equipment were just coming into the market. So there was a, a nascent relational database business, some small applications that people would build outside of the data center, but it still was about the data center. So when I joined Booz Allen and Hamilton, it was about consulting to the CEO of large corporations on the use of information technology as a strategic advantage. How do you use IT? Very early days, this was 1980, 1983, 85, very early days in using information technology to compete. And so we would uh, provide consulting help to, to do that. And some of the early adapters, CEOs that really thought they could use IT as a competitive weapon were our clients. Then after that experience, you went off to Oracle in 1992 and came in as president and COO. I came in as president of Oracle USA. Oracle so, USA. Yeah, I didn't have international responsibility. 18 months later, I took over international responsibility and was the president. Okay. Now, Oracle was, is one of those famous enterprise software companies that was, it was on uh, had some great days back then, but they, when you came into the company, it was having some tougher times. What was, what was happening? Well, uh, Oracle had grown probably five or six years. It doubled its revenues for a long time, and it just grew up before it was ready to grow up. So it was all about just you know, software. You know, when people like your software, it's real easy to create revenue because it doesn't take much manufacturing or you know, back office to produce. You basically, the engineers have to write the software, you capture a golden disk or a golden copy of that software, and then you can distribute it anywhere. Today, it's even easier on the internet, but then we had to put it onto, onto CDs and, and actually ship the software. Um, so the revenues grew to a billion dollars by 1991, 1990, but there was no infrastructure to support the, the number of customers, the, the amount of uh, global uh, uh, reach that they had, and it really became an tenuous uh, uh, situation with customers and Oracle trying to support that whole, that whole thing. They really were a $100 million company trying to support a billion dollars of revenue. So it collapsed. It basically, in, the, in 1991, uh, Oracle got to a point where it actually ran out of cash, came very close to zero cash, uh, customers were extremely angry with the company because to, to support the revenue growth, they were shipping you know, whatever the latest release of the software was, it had a lot of bugs in it, and finally got to the point where they were recognizing revenue that they otherwise could not recognize as a public company. So they had to sign a consent degree with the SEC. So it, the company was in a lot of trouble in 1991, 1992. Now there's a lot, and there's a lot of turmoil throughout your, your tenure as president, in those days, the early days of I, uh, IT, it was the Wild West. Um, profits were going through the roof, stock valuations are going even higher, and there were a lot of cowboy type leaders out there. You were always rep reputed to be the steadying influence for, for Larry Ellison, who was the chair and CEO. When you're number two in the company, how do you work, how do you make it work with a boss who has a different viewpoint, a different Attitude well, so, so let me kind of correct one thing you said. I wouldn't call it a lot of turmoil. Uh, we quickly got the problems behind us. So I, I didn't expect it to happen as fast as it did. When I came in in 1992, there was a CFO named Jeff Henley that came in at the same time. Uh, Larry could go back to focusing on the product. That's what he does best, is focusing on the product. He got Oracle 7 delivered. We were not competitive in the marketplace. A company called Sybase had delivered a much better product had a programmable server, a lot of stored procedures, and you know, it just you were able to create applications much differently than if you used Oracle. So in about two years, we had Oracle repositioned as the leader in the marketplace, and now we were set to grow in the same fashion we were growing in the 80s. One thing changed though on us, and that was the internet. We didn't forecast that it would that the internet would come along, and so all the technology that we had counted on delivering to the marketplace had to change. We had to change to an internet model where the customer, the user of the software would use a, uh, uh, a less capable computer. Didn't have to use all the power of a PC, a personal computer. 
they could use what we called a thin client. And because and, internet access today, think about accessing the internet through your smartphone or an iPad, you don't really need a lot of capability on those machines, just a user interface, and all the capability is back on the server. And so we had to build our software and our applications, our database and our application, to conform with the internet and established Oracle as a leader in that, that business, an early leader in the business. Our business applications were the first ones on the internet where you could actually, with a browser, you didn't need the application sitting on your PC, with a browser you could access the applications. Now you mentioned uh, that it was the Wild West, and no question about it. I think at Oracle we were very, very focused on delivering uh, heavy duty software. This is the you know, database and application software to run all of the business operations of Fortune 500 companies is much different than the quote dot com business of the 90s. We were selling a lot of database and tools to dot com companies, so that accelerated our growth. When that ended, certainly we felt it. Oracle felt it, I, it's about the time I left Oracle, so we felt the end of that dot-com era, so that you know we were the tools that those dot-coms were using to build their applications. Now, you, you left um, Oracle under interesting circumstances, a phone call while you were off on vacation, and you resigned. Well, you asked, you asked about how, how it was to work with Larry Ellison. Larry focused on product. He never really understood. He said to me one day, I don't understand what it means to be a CEO. I really never got that job. I was never trained for that job. He went from programmer to CEO. Never any interim management jobs. And so I understand what it, Larry would say, I understand what it is to develop software and provide that software and actually compete in a market that, have, you know, that has competitive products. But I don't understand what it means to be a CEO doesn't really like to spend time with customers, doesn't like to spend time traveling around the world to meet customers, and there were hundreds of thousands of customers. So the synergy was pretty good, where he could focus on product, I could focus on customers, nobody really focused on being CEO. We were partners. I think that's the best way to look at it, and as Larry once said to the press, the reason we get along is we're both slaves to reason. We're just slaves to logic, whatever makes sense, happens. We had offices opposite each other, there was a boardroom next to us, and it just kind of worked because I really loved working with customers, traveling, making sure that our software is being used and compete against others so our, our customers were using our software. He loved building the products. The internet changed all that. Larry said, I think I now understand what a CEO does. What I'm supposed to do is engineer the company to take advantage of the internet, which means we need fewer salesmen, we need fewer customer service people, we need fewer. And I said, Larry, I agree with you someday, maybe a decade from now, but it won't work now. And so for the first time we disagreed on how the company should be run, and there's only room for one boss. And uh, you know, I, and uh, it was like mom and dad. So if, if, in fact, he said this to me on that call you referenced, he said, you know, when I want something done, people come running to you and say, hey, convince dad that we shouldn't do that. And, and he, he just wanted to consolidate power. So. Thanks for being here, Ray. Okay. We're going to take a quick break, but when we return, we'll talk with Ray Lane about his work as non-executive chairman at Hewlett Packard and being managing partner at Kleiner Perkins. Welcome back to Leaders on Leadership. Joining us today is Ray Lane, and we're talking about his work at Hewlett Packard and his work at Kleiner Perkins. Thanks for being here, Ray. Mm -hmm. You are manage a managing partner at Kleiner Perkins Caulfield & Byers. That's not a household name to a lot of people. What's that company and what's it do? So when I left uh, Oracle, it was basically uh, a, 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 you know, an, an argument with Larry about you know, who, who there needs to be one boss, and so I just said it makes sense for me to, to leave. It was a good time to leave. Uh, we had had a great run, and it was a it was a it was a good thing. So I looked at okay, so what should I do next? Uh, and my friends, my partners at Kleiner Perkins, called me and said, you know, it makes sense with all your operating experience, all your technical experience. You're the perfect model for what we like as a partner at Kleiner Perkins. 
Kleiner Perkins is the leading venture capital firm in the world. Uh, there are other leaders. Uh, you know, we have a handful, I would say six, that are great venture capital companies that tend to work the way we do, hire great technical expertise, great operating expertise, and try to focus on building great companies. And if you do that, you will provide a return to your limited partners. Our limited partners happen to be the greatest university endowments in the country, Stanford, Yale, Harvard, Carnegie Mellon, and, uh, and a few foundations. That's who we work for, as well as we put our own money into this. But we, we're, our, our job is to fund early stage companies, entrepreneurs who have a dream, and they want to disrupt the industry, disrupt the current state of affairs. And so they have an idea like Jeff Bezos has. Now we funded Jeff to build Amazon, e-commerce online, and look what he has today. Or Larry and Sergey had with Google, uh, probably the 12th search engine to be invented, but they had an algorithm that was uh, an algorithm that we thought would win in the search game, and, they de and we helped develop a business model around that. Uh, and, and so on and so on, or Mark Andreessen at Netscape. We love to see the disruptive entrepreneur who has this dream and, and can, can accomplish more than anyone thought they could accomplish with less resources than anyone else. That's what we do. It's primarily early stage and rapid, rapid growth. Recently, we've been investing a lot in clean tech companies, and that's my focus today. I like it. I spring out of bed in the morning to learn something new, uh, physics or chemistry. Uh, I'm in, and the reason I'm in Detroit today is I'm heavily invested in the automotive business. And I believe the automotive business is going to be disrupted greatly over the next 10 years with new technology, uh, with new policy, uh, restricting the use of oil and restricting the, the emission of carbon uh, pollution. Now, while you're doing all this exciting high-tech startup business, you're also serving a role in a company I don't think counts as a startup, Hewlett Packard, right. it's non-executive chairman. Right. That's a company we all know as, a, as an equipment and a hardware type company, I, but I keep reading that the whole business mix is thinking about being changed. How do you change, what do you want the mix to be and how do you get there? And so if you're interviewing my family, they would tell you, well, you know, Ray's just got this, this this uh, kind of twist in his DNA that has him do stuff. You know, he doesn't think that he's limited in any way. He doesn't not limited by 24 hours in a day or seven days in a week. And and so when I was approached to be chairman of Hewlett Packard, I didn't look at it as being equipment or software. Or I looked at it as being uh, the jewel in the crown of Silicon Valley. Hewlett Packard, 50 year, 60 year old company that really uh, built Silicon Valley is a uh, treasure to all of us in Silicon Valley. And it had lost its way. It had lost its way by recruiting two outside CEOs that were very different. Uh, one that thought that uh, she would change the strategy uh, without changing the operations, and the other one who was just focused on a balance sheet, just focused on spreadsheets to, to drive a P&L for Wall Street, and didn't think about the longer term. Both of those strategies were wrong. And I thought, boy, this is a challenging business problem at the end of my career to, what I love doing is working with entrepreneurs, but wouldn't it be interesting to help not be CEO of, because that obviously is a full-time, seven day a week, 24 hour day job, but help solve the problem of making Hewlett Packard great and, uh, and, and, and give it the right strategy. Now you, you had asked about equipment, to software. So there's no question that that the world is moving towards software. E equipment, as you call it, servers, storage, networking, is commoditizing. So uh, there are only a few equipment providers left, IBM, Dell, HP. Uh, in networking, it's Cisco and HP and a few others. And so these tend to be like you know General Mills and Kellogg or, or GM and Chrysler and, and Ford. You get to a small number of players who compete on incremental advantages in their equipment, but the real competition, the real advantage that's brought to customers is in the software end of it. So HP uh, needs to have a larger software portfolio. It has a large services portfolio because it bought EDS. 
but it needs a larger software portfolio. The strategy, the stated strategy of HP now is to enable, better than anybody else, solutions or outcomes in the cloud. So if our customers can ignore why they have to select all the components of technology that they can't keep up with. They can't keep up with the latest server stuff, the latest network stuff. They don't want to. They just want a solution delivered at lowest possible cost. So what HP's about now is delivering that solution, whatever that solution is, some vertical solution in the automotive business, some application in the oil business, something in banking. Deliver that solution and then keep delivering that solution on the web out of the cloud so that the customer only has to be concerned about the operation of his business. Besides all of this uh, change of business focus that you're, that you're taking on as, as non-executive chair, there's also a lot of things in the, there's been in the media a lot in right. the last couple of years. Right. Both you coming in as an outsider right. as chair, uh, your CEO came in as an outsider, right. there was the, uh, the shareholders voting against executive coming. Uh, uh, compensation proposal, which is pretty rare. All of those things. How, when you're the, when you're in the chair job, how do you deal with all that media exposure on kind of internal business? Yeah, I, I handle it much too directly. I take it on very, very directly. So, if ISS wants to pick a fight with me, ISS is an advisory service to shareholders on compensation, and they were clearly wrong on their their vote. I have no problem with them saying you need to listen to shareholders more on compensation. I love it. I, I, I'm totally fine with a no vote on that. But they also, because everyone agreed that the HP board needed some changing, so I went to work and changed it fast. Then ISS recommends against those board members because I changed them too fast. It makes no sense. Uh, what I did, they say, is I skirted the nominating and governance committee. I did not. <laughs> I basically recruited, so I know everybody in the industry, Leo knows everybody else in the industry. We came up with a, a list of candidates and handed them to the nominating and governance committee. They didn't take the time to find out. They didn't take the, so they basically, right, they lost. Okay, so they lost the most important vote. The advisory service on compensation, I'm fine with that. I don't mind that spotlight. I don't mind it as long as people are willing to deal directly on facts. The media, our media in this country no longer deals in facts. And a lot of industries kind of just deal on self-serving purposes. So, um, so I, look, I want to be measured on, did we produce a better result for shareholders? Did we do that? We have not done that yet, and so I need to be held accountable for that. Okay, I've got one last question for you, Ray. Let's put you in a hypothetical situation. You, you work on the, you serve on the board for your alma mater, West Virginia University, so you know the ongoing discussions about online classes. Some people hate them, some people love them. They're taught by faculty who learn to teach in a classroom. They're attended by students who learn to learn in a classroom. Right. And they use software written by software experts. Mm -hmm. Let's assume a new company comes to you at Kleiner Perkins looking for funding and they want to take that whole paradigm five generations forward in one leap. And you're going to be chair of that company. How are you going to lead that project? Well, the world is going online. Okay, so it's, it's undeniable. You might as well just kind of skip to the future and say all retailing, uh, information management, printed media is going away. I mean, I don't even take newspapers anymore. I just read them on my iPad. You can read the exact same copy on your iPad and take it with you. And so it, it's understandable that education will become m more and more online. You can't simply take the curriculum that was developed for the classroom and just move it online. It can't be done. And so uh, thinking about how you would be able to take classes online and do it in an interactive setting. Uh, my wife just completed a degree online. Uh, she actually completed it at West Virginia University and did it from California while she's on three boards and raising two kids. So, and she's on the school board as well. So she did it, but she found it was very difficult to, that she couldn't interact with a teacher. She couldn't interact well like, like in a classroom. She had a three hour time difference from when the, kind of the, 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 fact, the faculty couldn't put themselves in a different time zone. And, and so she had to adapt, adapt the software to the person, don't have the person adapt to the software. Thanks for being here, Ray. Okay. okay. Please join us again next time for another edition of Leaders on Leadership. See you then.
Major funding for Leaders on Leadership is provided by Greenleaf Trust. Helping people manage their wealth, accumulate assets, and preserve those assets for generational continuity implies trust. We are sitting down on the same side of the desk as you are. We're planning for your financial needs. Additional funding provided by the Wayne State University School of Business Administration. An encore presentation of Leaders on Leadership is available online for viewing at dptv.org.